So the book Hindutva Origin, Evolution and Future consists of eight chapters. The first chapter is about the origin of the word Hindu and its relation to the term Hindutva. There is this beautiful story about Siddhartha saving the swan which was um, harmed by Devadat. And the relation of Siddhartha's healing hands and the wounded swan, that is the relation between what we call Hindu Dharma and Hindutva. Look at the term Hindu. Usually it is said that uh, the term Hindu has been given to us by the foreigners because it is essentially a geographical term and it is to the people who are living on the other side of the Indus River. Here I try to give a new interpretation based on what you can call the basic evolution of human consciousness. There is a new emerging field called um, neuroarchaeology which tries to understand what kind of cognitive processes happen in the mind of a civilization or culture based on the archaeological finds. One can think of a psychologist called Julian Jaynes as the person who uh, gave the fundamentals for this new way of looking at civilizations. And he, he, he proposed something called the breakup of the bicameral mind, the, the, the collapse between the left brain and the right brain and uh, the conversation that they were having as a kind of a auditory hallucination. And this gave rise to, he proposes that this gave rise to something called the axial gauge and the rise of monotheistic religions. This book came in 1970s. I think Richard Dawkins makes a very interesting comment on this particular person that either he was a great genius or he was a complete crackpot. Now, down the decades, there has been a lot of renewed interest in this particular bicameral mind hypothesis of the arise of human consciousness. And I interestingly found that Ram Swaroop independently had given a very more thorough uh, framework for understanding this particular process, where he, uh, though he doesn't name it, uh, he, he calls it a kind of a integration. So there is not a bicameral breakup, but a kind of a bicameral integration and that it happened in India. And what is the difference is that instead of monotheism, a particular external unit, external unit is the God, which is being used to unite this into a, a kind of a single consciousness. What actually we have here is a unity a fundamental unity and we incorporated all the so-called divine voices etc inside inside the consciousness of the person so this is something that resonates with vedic religion in fact julian james makes a single comment on the entire indian civilization he tells that the vedic religion uh, was a kind of a bicameral religion and it gravitated towards uh, upanishadic time when the unitary consciousness arose but actually we can find that this particular uh, internalization and uniform uh, uniformity or unity forming the basis that come there in the Vedic religion itself. You have this wonderful uh, story of the two birds sitting on the branches, etc. Now, we can also note another one aspect from this particular point of view. You have the yoga, yogi seals in Indus Valley, Harappan civilization, the yogi seals actually show that humans have developed at that time, Indian civilization has developed the concept of consciousness and a means of going inside this unitary consciousness that is existing and that resonates actually with the Upanishadic time. So this, irrespective of what the archaeologists say, this particular framework allows us to take the Upanishadic time to the Harappan period. Archaeologists, historians may differ, but this is a strong possibility. And a kind of a division arises now. The division between what later comes to be called the Zoroastrian religion. They actually go for the bicameral breakup and the monotheistic god outside. 
But there is yet another device, uh, yet another development that is instead of just monotheism, they tend to develop something called monopolistic religion. So in monopolistic religion, in monotheistic religion, you talk about an extra cosmic God, a creator God. In monopolistic religion, what happens? There is not only an extra creator God, but that is the only true God. All other gods become false. So here you have Ahirman and you have Agra Masta. Agra Masta is the God of light, Ahirman is the God of darkness. So all your theological enemies can be seen in this framework and they can be called as the agents of uh, Ahirma. So it is in Zoroastrianism that first this monopolistic religious concept arises. And they see the Vedic religion with a kind of disdain. There is this uh, interesting inscription some 2500 years ago which talks about the demolition of the temples of the Devas by the Zoroastrian kings. And the establishment of the true God, God Agra Masda. You, you can, can just have to remove Agra, Agra Masda and you have to remove the Deva temples. You can keep the Deva temples even and you have to put in another one name and you would have an, an uh, statement by Alauddin Bilji. So that is, where, that is where you actually have this particular uh, monopolistic religion arising. And, and they have a disdain for the religion that exists in this side of the Indus and it is here first you have the term Hindu, Hindu. So, in inscription, this word Hindu arises. But what is actually the original source of the word Hindu? In Vigveda, and this was identified by, again interestingly, Airavada Mahadevan, who was a Dravidianist. And he was studying the Rigveda, and he had a convoluted theory actually. He says that the Soma actually, actually belongs to Rigvedic uh, to the Harappan civilization. And he says that it is the Soma ritual with the filter that is being represented in this uh, uh, unique seal. And he states that that particular small drops you can see actually, if you look at that uh, unicorn seal of the Harappan civilization, you can see small drops coming out. And he says that this, these drops were called Hindu. Now, the Soma filter comes out as drops and it is called Hindu at one point. In the river Sukta of Rigveda, the branch of the river Indus, Sindhu, is called Susoma. So now you have dots, the dots of Susoma as one of the branches of the Sindhu river in river Sukta. You have Hindu that is related to Soma and in later period you have Soma, Hindu related to moon. So all these dots are already there in place. And next what you see, Huan Swan, almost I think 1300 years ago, he comes here and he writes about this nation and he says that this nation is called Hindu. He writes this, this nation is called Hindu. That is some 700 years before Raja Raja Chola. He identifies, in fact Huan Swan had come to Kanchi also. So he had come to South India also, so he calls the entire nation as Hindu and he says why? Because not because of the Indus river and he gives a spiritual meaning to this. He says this nation shines like moon when there is spiritual darkness because of its rishis and jnanis and the bodhisattvas and others and so this nation is called Hindu. So thus you have not only Hindu, not only as a geographical term, but also as a sacred term emerging. And then you see this term again arising during the Krishna Devaraya's time, during the Vijayanagara Empire times, Hindu Raya comes. So the term has always been there and what does it represent? It represents the theodiversity of this land. As I said, the monopolistic expansionist forces, they always want to destroy theodiversity. The term theodiversity was coined by Professor Logesh Chandra, a Buddhist scholar. So, whenever this monopolistic expansionism tries to destroy the theodiversity, <coughs> the term Hindu becomes important. It, it is like your immune system, despite all the diversity inside your body, when a hostile thing enters, your immune system reacts with the concept of an unified self. 
Then only the concept of the unified self comes. The same way, in a natural religion like Hindu Dharma, the term Hindu naturally arises whenever there is a threat to one of the civilizational cores of this nation, which is theodiversity. So this comes. This is the first chapter. And how this term Hindu has been coming again and again, <coughs> that has been explained in that. What do we mean by Hindu? Savarkar's definition of the term Hindu. Actually, in 19, I think 1940s, when Dr. Ambedkar wrote um, Thoughts on Pakistan, he zeroes in on this definition of Hindu by Savarkar. Savarkar says that anyone who considers this nation as Punya Bhumi or Pitru Bhumi is a Hindu. So, Ambedkar notes that this actually is a very brilliant definition because this includes everybody except Christians, Muslims, Jews, and Parsis. So the tribals are Hindus, people who believe in the Vedas are Hindus, people who don't believe in the Vedas, who don't know about the Vedas, they are also Hindu. Arya Samajis are Hindu, Brahma Samajis are Hindu. So this gives a theoretical basis for the term Hindu, he says. And when he creates the Hindu code bill, he uses almost the same definition there. He, he doesn't say the, anyone who considers this nation as uh, Pitrubhumi and Punya Bhumi, rather he says that anyone who is not a Jew or a Christian or Muslim or Parsi, all those people are Hindu. So this is the journey of the term Hindu and Savarkar also says that Hindutva is, is essentially a universal set of which Hindu Dharma is the subset. We have to understand here that when he is talking about this Hindu Dharma, it is, he is talking about the popular concept of Hindu Dharma as the Vedic religion. So Vedic religion has its own greatness, great contribution, but it is still part of the greater civilizational process. And interestingly, the first person to use the term Hindutva as a civilizational process was not Savarkar. Savarkar improved upon it. The first person who used this was Ravindranath Tagore. The term Hindutva had already been used, but, but as a civilization, as representing the civilizational process, as the basis of civilizational process, the use of the term Hindutva, the credit goes actually to Rabindranath Tagore. And we come to the second chapter. The second chapter is about Bharat Mata. There has been a propaganda that, that Bharat Mata is actually a colonial import. So this chapter goes into the roots of Bharat Mata right from the Vedic times into the uh, culture that has been in uh, Tamil Nadu in terms of the Sangam literature, Chilapadiharam and then it shows how every time there, there has been a fight that is needed to protect this nation, this goddess who takes the weapon, she has surfaced in the consciousness of this nation. For example, we have Madhura Vijayam written by Ganga Devi, where she talks about how Kampana Nayaka comes to dislodge the Madurai Sultans, who had actually closed the temples and who have been butchering the cows everywhere and who have been threatening people and tyrannizing them to uh, convert their religion. And that Kampana Nayaka has been sent. Kampana Nayaka comes here. He captures Kanjiburam and he becomes complacent. His real goal was to liberate Madurai. But after catching uh, Capturing Kanjiburam, he becomes kind of complacent. And then in his court appears a woman and a sage. She takes a sword and tells that this was the sword that was given to the Cholas and the Pandyas by she herself. And, we am, and I am offering this to you now. You take the sword of Dharma and you dislodge the Madurai Sultans. So you have this goddess who takes the weapon and gives it to protect the dharma or it comes there. And as you all know that the sword of Shivaji was called Bhagavad, uh, Bhavani and the sword of uh, dagger of uh, Guru Govinda Singh was called Bhagavati. Not only that, we can tell that this all com comes in this particular cultural matrix so these stories have arisen. When the Britishers were capturing Nagaland, Rani Gudinu. She has a vision. She goes into a, village, into a cave, sitting on a tiger, a goddess gives her a rifle. So this goddess, who 
gives you weapons to fight against this monopolistic forces. She comes again and again in her history and it is this that has come out as Vante Madram and Bharat Mada during the colonial times. So that is about the second chapter. And the third chapter is about cow. What actually we mean by the protection of cow and how this worship of cow has always been there in the Hindu culture. Who are all have defended it. In fact, the entire freedom owes its origin to cow protection. When Britishers captured this nation, they saw all these cows and they wanted to eat them in a very big manner, in a very corporate manner, in an industrial manner. Because they wanted them to be the food for their soldiers who would go and campaign in other parts of India, like Afghanistan and other regions. But what was stopping all this was the cow protection, the cow veneration that has been there in, with the Hindus. And even the so-called uh, Mughal emperors, they even they had to bow down to this when they were under the Marathas. So the Britishers, they tried to get some pandits and write that cow eating was already there in the Vedas, etc, etc. And they tried to make this look like it was a very progressive thing, etc. And at that time, in Tamil Nadu, there was this saint Vallalar. And when he writes, and in, now you have to remember that Vallalar is being co-opted, is this the entire Dravidian movement and the uh, this Dravidian Christian movement, it is trying to appropriate Vallalar. If you look at Vallalar pictures, 10 years before, he would be wearing Vibhuti. If you look at Vallalar pictures now, Vibhuti would be erased. And he is shown as a kind of anti-Vedic, uh, anti-caste warrior, social warrior. Actually, he was definitely against social discriminations, but he was not anti-Vedic. He openly stated, and he was one of the earliest persons to talk in Tamil Nadu about the nature of Hindu family of religions against the Abrahamic family of religions. And he says that it is this Hindu family of religions that can actually import to a person, these are the words of Vallala, that can import to a person immortality. If this particular science is present in other religions, it is an approximation of what is present in Hindu Veda Gamas. That is what Vallala. Now just think, such a person is being uh, appropriated and that means how much weak we have become. Okay, now coming back to this. So Vallala understands one thing, that if India is made into a nation of cow eaters, into a nation of cow butchers, then our civilizational back spine could be actually broken. Had that happened, the famines would have been severe, even more severe. And we would not have been able to stand again. So Vallalar actually, he writes, his first book, what he writes is about the story of Manini the Chola, in which, as most of you would be knowing, the Chola king has a son who had accidentally run his uh, chariot on a calf. And then the cow comes and demands justice to the Chola king. What the Chola king does is, now it is very important, the Brahmin ministers in his... Uh, uh, court, they are telling that there is prayashita. There are prayashitas in by which you actually uh, remove this particular sin. But the king demands that justice should be done, and then the king describes to his courtiers, the basically his Brahmin ministers, the greatness of the cow. In which part of the cow, which date he decides. He elaborately talks about it and then tells, so to get that cow justice, I would kill my own son. Now he places his son in the wheel of chariot and he uh, runs the chariot over the sun. Okay, this is a very celebrated story in Tamil Nadu and Vallala chooses this story. The reason is because he knows that if cow slaughter happens, then India's civilization will be broken. In the north, you have the famous Kuka movement, which was the first Swadeshi movement. And they also fight because they wanted to protect the cow. So this is about the cow protection that happened and what are all the uh, things that have been happening after that. And, and here I mentioned about Mahatma Gandhi also. So Mahatma Gandhi took the cow protection and he was actually 
proto hindu ecological thinker we can consider him that okay and he states that this cow protection is symbolic of it is the greatest civilizational value of this country and based on this we can actually show that we respect all life and he wants hindus to do an outreach to the muslims convert them to protect the cow to, to marinate the cow that would have been a great what i would call a conversion movement from the side of the hindus okay so that is the about the cow protection aspect and the fourth thing that we are coming to the fourth chapter talks about the social equality racism etc one of the charges that has been always leveled against hindutva is that hindutva is a kind of a desi version of racism and nazism so here the chapter talks about the important contributions of the hindutva to the social emancipation of islam right so in if you look at uh, any society of that period you would find that the marriage age of girls was very low and it was around 1869 18 uh, 89 like that they were actually changing and for information in the roman catholic canonical laws till very recently the marriage age of girls was very very low it was only after francis came that he understood this could create very bad uh, publicity that he changed it till then the marriage age was very low and that this provision that wherever you live you adapt to the land of that particular the law of that particular land okay now this marriage age here also it was very low and people used to say that this is our religion and you should not touch it those who actually ran a campaign against this they were not christian missionaries they were not european reformers it was a person called herb vilas sharda this herb vilas sharda was a strong hindutvait he wrote a book called the superiority of hindu civilization he was the first person to talk about a pan asian hindu buddhist alliance to counter arabian as well as the european onslaught he was also an arya samaji and he was the one who was responsible for raising the marriage age and this created a great social revolution and this social revolution in this nation was created by hindutvaits that is our legacy our heritage and then this is 2023 in 1923 in um, the bombay legislative assembly a, a resolution was passed this resolution was moved by ck bole sitaram keshav bole and this resolution said that the scheduled community persons should be free to go and use the public water bodies they should be free to walk the public roads they should be free to use the public parks etc etc that was a very important resolution act and it was made into a law bole law and it was based on this law that the magad satyagraha starts and dr ambedkar's magad satyagraha is one of the very important events in the history social history of india as we all know and when case was put on uh, dr ambedkar etc very important hindu mahasabha leader was the witness in favor of dr ambedkar that was narayan damodar savarkar vinay damodar savarkar could have gone there but he couldn't because he was under house arrest so he couldn't leave ratnagiri actually so he couldn't come narayan savarkar went and he and he was the person who was actually injured very very seriously injured during the gandhi uh, assassination after riots and he died because of that this was a person who fought not only for freedom political freedom of this nation but also social freedom of this nation so this bole resolution is the most important resolution who was this ck bole ck bole later joined provincial hindu maga sabha and when dr ambedkar was going to constituent assembly he meets him at the airport and puts a demand you should recommend the saffron bhagava flag as the national flag of india so look at the kind of contribution they have made when scheduled communities were very much oppressed it, it was the great hindu maga sabha leader jayakar parishtra jayaga who actually passed a resolution telling that there should be reservation for scheduled communities in police forces so you cannot categorize the hindu maga sabha people as kind of or hindutva movement as kind of uh, patriarchal uh, brahmanical etc etc these were all loaded terms in terms of social emancipation of this land 
Hindu Maga Sabha and Hindutva movement has contributed more than most others. So that is about the chapter. Then, then the next chapter talks about the non sunk Hindutva leaders, the controversies, etc., related to them. So it talks about, for example, Veer um, Savarkar, Munje, Munje meeting with uh, Mussolini, for example. So it has been said by that uh, Indian scholar that. Munjai actually met Mussolini and it was this fascist influence that led to the formation of RSS. The reality is completely different. Why did Munjai go to meet Mussolini? Did he meet only Mussolini? Actually Munjai visited all the military schools through Europe. He went to England, he went to, he went to England, he visited the military schools there. He went to France, he visited the military schools there. He went to Germany, he visited the military schools. He went to Italy, he visited the military schools. And at that time, Mussolini was considered as a person who was favoring Indian independence movement. The great leader in India who used to tell everyone who comes to him to go and visit Italy and see Mussolini. His name was Mahatma Gandhi. So that was the kind of atmosphere that existed then. But why did Mussolini go and why did Munjai go and visit Mussolini and the military schools? Because he was part of a committee. And this committee was asking for complete recruitment. At that time, this British had this idea that there were only few communities that were military communities. And uh, this martial races or martial jadis alone could be recruited for army. So there was no uni universal recruitment. Munjai was fighting for universal recruitment. All the jadis, irrespective of which jadi a person belongs, it should be recruited into the army. So Munjai wa wanted to uh, state his case with very good evidence. He went and he saw how this military training students throughout Europe, and he found that it was it was universal military training, and he was actually substantiating. For that, he visited. In other words. The British were implementing a pseudo-scientific racial theory, which is very similar to the Nazi concept. And Mussolini was building a case against this. In, sorry, uh, Munche was building a case against this. And he was for universal military recruitment. So this is completely different things. How this has been made into by propaganda is very interesting. So it deals with this kind of uh, myths in this chapter. Then we come to the RSS. The different uh, myths relating to RSS, the kind of studies that have been made about RSS today. Uh, our uh, Dr. Vikram Sambat talked about uh, them, and, and uh, uh, Ranganathan, they talked about the mixing of fiction and non fiction, etc. When I was going to Shagas, that was in, um, when I was 14, I was going to Shagas, and at that time, this uh, verbal gas tragedy happened. And one of the stories they used to tell in the Shagas is how the RSS people were going and how they were there along with the military, only the RSS people were there rescuing people, etc., etc. But you don't find all that in any of the books around you. Okay. Later, Dominic Lapper, who died recently, who was the author of Freedom at Midnight, he came out with a book on Bhopal. In that book, he gives the entire credit to Teresa of Calcutta. She was went and she, at once when the Bhopal tragedy happened, she goes there along with some sister. She goes there, the sister was a fictional character. They go and they work with the people. And what did the Indian army do? The Indian army completely caught on of the entire Bhopal and didn't allow anybody to go out. And it was, the Indian government was as if killing the people. And it was Mother Teresa who was going and serving the people there, despite the fact that the army was very oppressive. Almost 25, 20, 25 years ago, this kind of a narrative is being given as fiction. Okay. And I remembered very well that Teresa went there for one reason. Teresa went there, of course. She went there so that she could lobby to release the chairman of uh, Union Garbite. That is the reason she went there. She didn't go there to help the victims. But the whole thing has been changed. And they went and asked the RSS people, actually, if there are any RSS people here, they should forgive me. They went and asked the RSS people, do you have any photos? I want to write an article about this. Do you have any photos of your people helping uh, the victims? Then the RSS people gave their characteristic answer. Gee, no, 
See, we are helping our brothers. Why should we take pictures of we helping our brothers? That was the answer they gave. Then when I was searching, I found a particular person. He was a Christian who was a photographer. You remember that photo of a child, only the face of the child and the hand would be on the child. That photo was taken by him. And he had put an online uh, picture, photo exhibition. In that photo, and he was, uh, naturally he was uh, anti RSS, anti BJP, etc. But he had put these photos. In that photo, there were these half pint balas going and serving people, etc. So, what I heard in my shaga was actually validated by these photos, but our people didn't care to even document these things. As I said, these young people, they always think, okay, we are doing the same, what is wrong? But why should we take a photo and why should we publicize it? But then the narrative is getting set like this. And also another one important aspect of RSS that this book discusses is about how within a small period of any disaster, RSS has been able to go and reach a particular place. Anywhere in India, whether the disaster is man-made or natural disaster, the first persons to go and reach that place during that particular golden window time they were the RSS people. How RSS made it possible? There has been no study on this. There has been no study on this. There are a lot of academic studies demonizing RSS, but this crucial aspect, this cost-effective organization, it does not need a building, it just needs a small ground, and it does not have membership, yet it is able to bring together the cadre at any particular time of uh, disaster, even where RSS is weak, they are able to bring together the cadre to help people, irrespective of caste, jati, uh, religion, etc. And there is a very great quote by Guruji Golwalkar. Whenever you talk about Guruji Golwalkar and quote, there is only one quote everybody uses is in 1939, when he told that there is this, uh, we have to learn this lesson from Germany and how she has purged the other races, etc., etc. There is a clear uh, explanation of what actually he said and in what context he said, etc., in that particular book. But here, um, what happens here is that uh, Guruji Golwalkar tells, instructs the RSS cadre in a personal letter that was published very long time later. In a personal letter, not for publicity. In a very personal letter, he tells this. When you are going and serving people, don't differentiate them based on religion, caste, etc. When you serve, serve them with the notion that you are serving the divine. The way a priest would be offering puja to the deity in the Karbhagraha, the same way you have to serve a person. That is the words of a person who had been depicted as a monster in the general discourse. This is about the answers. Then there is a chapter on science and Hindutva. And this particular chapter I talk about today, interestingly, it is February 12, which is Darwin's Day. Okay. Uh, Darwin Day is celebrated, it, is his, it was his birthday, so Darwin Day is celebrated to celebrate evolution. J.B.S. Haldane once said that with the discovery of natural selection, actually Darwin converted the entire Europe in principle to Hinduism. An exaggeration, but uh, it's a very important thing. So this particular thing deals with the kind of exaggerations that are being made in the name of Hindutva. I call it Kalbo cult Hindutva. It is not a derogatory term as such. Marvin Harris has explained what is Kalbo cult. So when, when, when uh, the aborigines of certain uh, Pacific islands, they understood that they have helped somehow in the creation of the modern civilization, but they have been denied the fruits of modern civilization. So they create this cargo cult where the West had to repay. The same way, we have actually done a lot of contributions, but we don't know how to express those contributions. And we have been denied education of this particular aspect. I can tell you one example for this, a very solid example. There was this great scientist called Pushpak Pardava. He was a great scientist. He was a great institution builder also, okay. But he was also a propagandist. So they created in 1970s here an exhibition called MOSC, Method of Science Exhibition. In this exhibition, there were different panels were there. These panels became very famous. This became a basis for teaching method of science in different uh, curriculum, even for arts students, by IGNO and other uh, open universities. And in this particular, there are different panels on method of science. You don't have a panel on Karl Popper. You don't have a, a, a panel on Thomas Kuhn. But you have a panel on Lenin and you have a panel on Karl Marx. 
Okay, so this is the kind of propaganda that was going on, and we were being denied completely our scientific heritage, and so naturally we get into pseudoscience and we tell that this has been already invented, etc., etc. But actually, we have contributed substantially. This particular uh, chapter deals with that aspect, and us uh, reason is post-independence when we needed a cyclotron. It was Menas Saha who brought in cyclotron, who first created the first nuclear facility. And in that, he was actually killed, uh, helped by Shyam Prasad Mugherjee. Despite the fact that Menas Saha had some kind of a Marxist uh, um, favoritism, despite that, it was Shyam Prasad Mugherjee and who helped him, and it was Jawaharlal Nehru who was trying to stop this war. So this is a very interesting aspect here. And we have Dr. Goldi Manohar Joshi, who was the brain behind Chandrayaan. Most of us don't know that. He was the one who created entire papers for Chandrayaan. He also created TKDL, Traditional Knowledge Digital Library, which actually reduced biopiracy by, say, 70% uh, or something. And this is again based on his Hindutva route. Right? All these aspects have been uh, dealt with in this particular chapter. The last chapter is about Samanvaya. There are two kinds of processes, we can say. One is a very theoretical process, which is called dialectics, which is a very mechanistic process. And then you have a very organic process, and that process is Samanvaya. Samanvaya actually takes in the different heterogeneous thought processes and tries to create a broad mosaic with kind of harmony. And here we explain this Samanvaya as the civilizational process that upholds the civilizational core value of theodiversity. And we deal with, in this particular chapter, I deal with how this Samanvaya worked with the Hindu family of religions, like uh, Vedic religion, Buddhism, Jainism, and uh, Sikh religion. In that particular Sikh religion, because just before we have been talking about it, I want to tell you an important aspect. The Sikh massacre that happened in 1984, didn't happen over... It was being built and Indira Gandhi government, Congress government, that it will create a grand human misery for generations. It was so the stereotype of and the stereotype of backward Hindu idols, etc. This was being created between both the communities, and then Congress can play themselves as one, they can they can be Jainist faced and they can tell that actually we are the who to protect the Hindus from the Sikhs, and to the Sikhs they can tell we are the only minority uh, defenders. So they were playing this at that time. RSS was the only organization, despite their terrorists went and killed the swine savers in the Shargas, they went on telling that the Sikh culture is our own culture, the Sikh heritage is our heritage. So I have put some uh, cover pages of the official RSS magazine in Tamil Nadu. You don't have any Sikh population. You are not playing to the gallery. Here, you will find that around 1980-84, they have again and again told about the sacrifices that the Sikh gurus did, the, what actually Sikh gurus meant, etc., etc. So that has been shown in this particular aspect. And then we come to Christianity and we come to Islam. In the case of Christianity, it is a very interesting thing that this book talks about is, in Indian context, Christianity interacts with Hinduism in three ways. One is, it tries for institutional appropriation of Hindu religious symbols and Hindu spirituality also. It is very, very, you can't even imagine what all the things that they have actually tried to do, how much time I have, how much more time I have. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Then, for example, there was in, in Kulitale near Trichy, there is an ashram. The name of the ashram is uh, Sachidananda Ashram. Okay, Sachidananda Ashram. And uh, the person who founded that ashram was called Asurubi Ananda. Okay, Asurubi Ananda, he founded this ashram. His real name was Monachini. He was from France. This particular so called ashram in the registry of uh, Catholic monasteries, it is. Uh, are uh, registered as a Benedictine monastery, not as Sachidananda Ashram. This is for our consumption. Okay. And this Arubi Ananda, he started working uh, models, a church very similar to a temple, etc., etc., so that people would get confused. 
Henry Lesau, who was his successor, he went a step further. He assumed the name Swami Abhishekananda. He wore this flowing saffron robes. He went and visited the Hindu temples, all the sacred places. Even a devout Hindu wouldn't have done that at that time, 1950s. He went to Sri Rangam. He went inside. There was this board. He writes in his autobiography. There was this board that was telling that non-Hindus are not allowed. He just was in a sly way. He went inside and he looked at all the people, their devotion, and at last they were giving prasada with the water and tulsi. He couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. At the same time, he exclaims in this all this devotion, all these beautiful sculptures. To whom they should belong to? They should belong to this one true God of Christianity. Unfortunately, this, they are all going to this pagan God. He goes to Elephant Caves. He goes to Elephant Caves and he looks, stands before that Mahadeva. He couldn't bear the beauty of it. He simply sits at that place and he cries and he says, "This beautiful sculpture should belong to Christianity." And then he goes to Thiruvannamalai. He goes inside the Virubhaksha cave and he sits there. He takes, wherever he goes, he also takes bread and wine. And then he conducts the holy mass there, telling that this place should one day belong to Christianity. And then he looks at the way people are approaching um, Ramana Magirishi. So he wants to train a boy as a Christian Catholic Ramana, the equivalent of Christian Catholic Ramana. Unfortunately, there is some interdenominational problem. The boy gets mixed away. So that project Ramana didn't happen. Then there is this twist. One day, he goes near uh, Rudra Prayaga, and there also in a Shiva temple, he had done the same thing. He had taken the bread and the wine, and he had conducted the uh, commune. As he was passing by, he had, he gets a heart attack. He falls down, and the people around that they come. There's this sannyasi who had fallen down. They didn't ask about what religion you belong to, etc. What sampradaya, nothing. They help him. In a very big way, and he gets his life back because of the Hindus, and he starts wondering about this particular thing. He brings to question all the things that he had done so far, and even though he was doing it as a kind of uh, just an experimental thing, all these yoga exercises, etc., that he had done, they also begin to have an impact on him. He writes in his diary. This church is keeping me still in the realm of Nama Rupa Vedas. I have to get out of this. I understand that, but I am wedded to the church. I cannot get out. So he becomes more and more critical of uh, Christianity, actually, and people start, sort of start disliking him, etc. So this is given in the book about how Christianity tries institutional appropriation. Then there is another one where they wage a proxy war. They don't fight directly with you. Rather, they create a movement like the Dravidian movement, and through the Dravidian movement, they fight. In fact, the Archbishop of Madurai he had written a book, 1950s, 1950s, called Christianity and Dravidian Movement, Christian Church and the Dravidian Movement. In that, he says, states that Dravidian Movement is the time bomb that we have placed to destroy Sanatana Dharma. Very clearly, they have stated that. But now, what had happened is that the Dravidian movement, uh, your Sun TV is actually telecasting Ramayana, Mahabharata, Veer Hanuman, Veer Ganapati, Bala Ganapati, etc. serials. So, the kind of there is a samanvaya process that is actually even absorbing these Dravidian movements, and they are resisting it. And their wives they send for the temples, and they would be talking all kind of nonsense. They would be facilitating Christian conversion there, and the wife would be going and visiting the. Hindu temples here. All these kind of schizophrenic activities are happening for the Dravidian movement. So the church has a contingency plan, SEMA. So they tell that this Dravidian movement has cheated you. Let us go for a pure Tamil Chavanist movement. And the pure Tamil Chavanist movement would tell that the Murugan whom you worship is not actually a god, but actually your ancestor. So the Murugan worship is only an ancestor worship. If it is only an ancestor worship, what prevents the converted Christian from entering the temple and offering worship to his ancestor in the way he thinks is right. He can light a candle there. He can come inside and he can light a candle there, right? So this kind of uh, things are there in incubator, ready to be unleashed once they get power. So all these are happening. So that is the second second way of interaction. Then there is a third way of interaction, which is 
directly you attack my LLP. Okay? It happened in Tripura, where NLFT, the National Liberation Front of Tripura, along with the Baptist Church, it went around and asked people to get converted. The Jamatiya tribes were hunted, they were killed, massacred, etc. I think uh, Santhya Jain, who is the sister of uh, Dr. Meenakshi Jain, she has written a book even about how these conversions happen in a violent way in Tripura. So these are all the way Christianity has been interacting with Hinduism in India. There are also exceptions. For example, the first book on RSS was written by a Christian priest. First English book on RSS was written by a Christian priest, Anthony Elinshivattam from Kerala. And then he came to Mumbai. He joined the freedom movement, etc. He was also Gandhian. So he was the person who coined the term pseudo-secularism against the Nehru government. In 1951, he published this book. And he praised RSS as the quintessential uh, patriotic uh, movement, etc. Then there was one famous Anthony D. Mella. Anthony D. Mella wrote a book called Sadhana. And it became a classic, a spiritual classic, cutting across all religious sections. He was a Jesuit priest, but he told that the master that I talk about is not just Jesus, it is also Krishna, it is also uh, Tao, uh, Law Roots, etc., etc. And he said that, he wrote actually, uh, Judas and Jesus are for me two movements of the same dance, etc. And the church was very angry. It completely prohibited his books. When Pope Benedict was Cardinal Ratzinger. Even today, there is this Inquisition office, office. It has another one name, but the Inquisition office is that they published an edict telling that his books should be removed completely from all the places. So here is an example of how uh, Christianity had been interacting. We should not forget the institutional um, aggression this monotheistic cults are unleashing. When we are studying the individual possibilities also that exist there. We should be very clear, so I have brought out this. And the RSS also, I've been having dialogue with the uh, Christian community. There was this famous social reformer called Joseph Kulakunnal in Kerala. And he was against uh, the institution of Christianity so much that he has been called the Judas of Kerala. And he was running a Kerala Indian uh, church, an Indian national church. And he had a very wonderful dialogue with the Dr. K. S. Sudarshan when he was the Sasanga Chalak of RSS. They agreed upon that there should be no conversion, that it should be Christian. Whatever, whoever Christians are here, they should actually adhere to an Indian national church and not the Catholic Church or uh, Church of England, etc. So this kind of dialogues have been happening. Then there is also an interaction with uh, Muslims that also have been uh, given in the book. So these are all broadly the way the Samanvaya is being dealt in the book in its last chapter. So this is about Hindutva as a process, a process of consciousness, a process of civilization, a civilizational process. And it is a process also of resistance, resistance against monopolistic aggression. And we have a great responsibility to take this process forward because this is the only model that exists for the entire humanity to manage constructively its differences with mutual respect. When the Hindutva becomes strong, let us assume we are going to Australia, we are talking to the Aborigines, and we are going to the Uluru rock there, there a Hindu can prostrate before it with the same devotion with which he would prostrate himself before Mount Kailash. That way, we would be validating the Aboriginal spirituality. We would be converting them to Hinduism. We would be validating the Aboriginal spirituality of that place. The same way, the natural religions everywhere where they have been intimidated, whether Native Americans, whether it is the African spiritual traditions, in all these places, a strong Hindutva can validate the spiritual traditions. Then, Naturally, the monopolistic religions will have to give up their monopolistic expansionism. We can create a, such a global civilizational pressure to make these religions leave out their monopolistic expansionism. We can actually dilute them. Sri Aurobindo actually has talked about this, okay, about diluting these aspects of uh, Islam and Christianity. 
we will be able to do it. So with this, I end the lecture. There are any questions? Thank you. I'm a dairy farmer, that's why I'm asking you this question about the cow. Um, I don't know the average consumption of milk in India of our 1.4 billion population, but like just take it as you know 300 ml per person per day, which makes a lot of milk per day. So to produce that means say uh, a cow is producing an average of 10 liters a day. So the number of cows we have to have, so the number of deliveries we have to have, 50% female, 50% male, Sustaining those male calves without culling them is a huge economic loss. How does one go about it? Because goshalas can't go because I have gone and visited goshalas. They don't have the funds. People don't come up with that kind of money. So what's the solution? Okay. Um, actually, I worked in Vegan the Kendra in Sustainable Agriculture section. You would be knowing that, right? So we know one thing about this that you should look at cow. In fact, K. Munshi had talked about this also in the parliament when he was agriculture minister. That we should also look at the cow for the manure that it produces and how this manure will play an important role in recycling of the nutrients. For example, you can use the manure for biogas production, small biogases. You can use them for biomethanation plants, for example. The, you can take the domestic uh, waste and you can feed it to the biomethanation plant. But to inculcate the bacteria in it, you have to use the cow, uh, cow dung slurry. And once the slurry comes out, and interestingly, this was talked about by uh, J.C. Kumarapa, uh, who was like Gandhian, as you know. And he had talked about uh, how biogas slurry can actually transform agricultural uh, economics, etc., etc. So all these aspects should be taken into consideration when you are talking about a cow, okay, an old cow. When you are talking about a old cow, its economic utility should be seen in terms of all these aspects. And to my knowledge, such a study has never happened, number one. Number two, I will come to a particular thing that is there in this book, okay. We always talk about the overgrazing of the cow. And the reason why overgrazing is destroying the ecosystems and so the cow should be killed, okay. The cow slaughter should happen. So this is one of the arguments that have been put forth by the Sarkari environmentalists. Right from the time of uh, Indira Gandhi during Salim Ali, they, they brought a Smithsonian uh, scholar to India. They took this wonderful photo, I think it was Raghur, I forgot, uh, of the cow uh, grazing on the land, a skinny cow. And they showed that how this uh, grazing, overgrazing by the cow is destroying the forest, etc. Okay? But Later they found that every village, so this was a propaganda that was done by the Indira Gandhi government in a big way to create these national parks and separate the villages from the farms completely. So that people cannot actually take their cows and graze in these lands. What actually was happening was that these cows, uh, the people would be taking the cows, they would be grazing the land and the old cows, probably the tiger or anything would come and would take that cow away, etc. would happen. Or if the cows are dying, for example, then they would be taken for uh, production of meat for the skinning of the cow, etc. would be happening. That way, in India, beef production without cow slaughter, by the death of the cow mostly, or very old cow getting killed, like mercy killing, that would make Indian beef ecologically better, superior to beef everywhere else. The, coming back to your question, the answer is, we have not studied the complete economic aspect and the externals as well as the other aspects of the cow, the commons that the cow creates. All these have not been studied. My question is actually specifically about the male cows, which are 50%. I'm talking about the male cows. So the male cows also give uh, cow dung, right? So I mean, dung, right? Oh, male cows, you're saying? Okay. I mean, male okay. uh, buffaloes. Yeah. Male buffaloes. They also give dung, right? So, these aspects have not been studied, number one. Number two, during the famines, during the famines, it has been found that protecting your buffaloes, protecting the male part of the uh, cow progeny, have actually helped 
agriculture to revive itself. So taking this into consideration, we have to make an effort and we have to save them. That is that. Sir, from the land of cow worshippers, Tamil Nadu, how it degenerated to a place where the North India is marked as cow belt? What happened to us? See, um, this is a very planned, very planned campaign, okay? Cow protection is there in our blood. Even today, it is in the urban uh, television that people are talking about uh, beef and people are mocking them as uh, uh, cow uh, urine drinkers and all that, right? There is this famous minister in Madurai, remember, who always used to mock us as uh, cow urine drinkers, right? Cow mutra drinkers, that is how he used to mock us. He had a grandfather. His grandfather actually with Panjabhavya, he installed the IFA Vigraha that is now being worshipped in Sabarimala. So if we are Komudra drinkers, naturally his grandfather was also a Komudra drinker, he has to accept that. Okay. So the point is, if even today, even today, if you go inside a Tamil Nadu village, full of Dravidians, people who work for DMK, go and tell that, I would like to have a beef biryani, it will be very hard for you to come out of that village. Okay, that is the reality. When all these vicious campaigns were not happening, I will tell you an example, one example from popular culture, okay? There was the movie in which uh, a yeah, poor boy belonging to some other jati was uh, in love with a girl who belongs to the zamindar of that particular village, etc. As usual, everything was happening. The father was adamant that he wouldn't give this girl to that boy, okay? Then what happens? One day his cow falls into the well. well. This boy rescues the cow. That moment, the father decides he would give his daughter to that boy. The minute he saved my cow, I decided I would give my daughter to the boy. So, this is the sentiment that is there. Everything else that is being told is absolute lie. Unfortunately, once you make a lie, a fashionable thing, a fashion statement, it starts percolating. So, we have to tell again and again that a person like Vallalar was for cow protection. There was a great uh, scheduled community leader called Munuswami who was in the parliament. And when the uh, preamble of the parliament, the directive principles were read, and when the directive principles talked about the protection of cow and the progeny, this Munuswami Pillai got up, he was a scheduled community representative from Tamil Nadu. He got up and said, as a Hindu, I am so happy that the directive principles have got cow protection in it. So that is the nature. That is the nature of uh, this society, irrespective of jati. This cow eating uh, scheduled community, etc., beef as a food culture, etc., it is being uh, wokeism, the woke actually, the Indic woke trend that is being created. That is how we create. Okay, you know? Okay.